left you here in this, this space. And God, I just pray that um, we would be open to the things that um, you would you would like to say to us this morning, God, that um, in places where we are holding on to pride or, um, God, just anything that gets in the way um, of us hearing your voice, God, I pray that that would be removed um, and that you would just be in everyone's hearts and ears and eyes this morning, God, as we uh, seek together your truth uh, and your word. In your name, amen. Amen. Thank you. So I want to tell you a story this morning, and all good stories begin with once upon a time. So once upon a time, there were two million Jewish men and boys and girls and women who lived in slavery, undergoing brutal oppression from their Egyptian taskmasters. For years and years, the people had prayed. They prayed, God, please deliver us. Help us get out of the situation we're in. And it seemed like Jehovah wasn't answering their prayers year after year no relief but god is never unaware he was listening he was watching he knew exactly what was happening he heard the cry of their his people and he called a man named moses to deliver his people from bondage now moses was unsure of himself he wondered why would god call someone like me to deliver the people of israel out of bondage why couldn't he pick someone else? But when God chooses someone, he isn't looking for anyone else. So God wouldn't let Moses out of the deal. He wouldn't listen to his excuses. Initially, Moses gives God five different excuses for why he shouldn't be the one to lead the people out of bondage. But God answers every excuse. Moses, a Hebrew who grew up in Egypt's palace, was uniquely qualified to lead the children of Israel out of slavery. But he wasn't a good speaker. So God uses Moses' brother, Aaron, to help Moses confront the Pharaoh. And let my people go is the message that God had for Pharaoh. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened. God allowed his heart to be hardened. And he would not let the people of God go. It wasn't part of his plans for his nation. So stubborn was Pharaoh that God would bring 10 plagues upon the nation of Egypt, each somewhat worse than the prior plague, until finally the firstborn male offspring of every animal and every human being was struck dead, except for those of the Jewish people who had taken the blood of a lamb and put it over their doors, and today they celebrate to this day the Passover. The people of God were let go. Two million people suddenly, two million people miraculously released from the oppression that they were facing in Egypt. But it didn't take long for stubborn Pharaoh to say, wait a minute, what have I done? And so he got his entire army on chariots in hot pursuit of the two million Jews who were making their way across the desert to the Red Sea. And there was a problem. There was a big sea. They were trying to get away. There's an army behind them. And the people looked at Moses like, what, have you brought us out here to die? And God says, Moses, I want you to raise your staff. And he raises his staff and the waters of the Red Sea rise on either side. And the children of Israel pass on dry land in a miraculous, miraculous event. I, mean, I wonder what it would have been like to be one of those people. To see the plagues, to see the deliverance, to now see sea walls that are lifted up on either side. We are going to take a trip this summer to Israel. We've decided it'll be a smaller team. If you're interested, please let us know before uh, the end of this week. Um, but one of the things that those who go to Israel this summer will see is the Red Sea. They'll have an opportunity to swim in the very waters where this event took place. And after crossing the Red Sea, the Jewish people saw God do something amazing. Moses took his arms down, and the sea covered the entire Egyptian army. They died, every one of their oppressors. And for the first time in years, generations, the children of Israel actually felt free. Do you know that there are books that have been written and uh, documented photographs of chariot wheels on the bottom of the Red Sea? There's this phenomenal book called The Exodus Case, 486-page book, 
that has all sorts of proof that the events of Exodus actually took place. Modern day Saudi Arabia is where a lot of these events uh, took place as they crossed uh, the Red Sea into Egypt. In fact, they believe that they have found the rock in scripture, the, the huge rock where Moses struck and water gushed like a river. And you see this rock where there's actual evidence of, of water coming out of this on top of this mountain for years and years and years and, and just amazing things. There are spots in, in Egypt where you can go. They think they may have found the spot where uh, the, the golden calf was put and uh, the altar that uh, that was placed upon. There's even uh, some evidence that maybe the mountain where God met with the people and the fire and the, the, and the, the lightning and the thunder that came down from heaven continually upon this mountain, where maybe that mountain was. There's this peak that is just charred, and there's no other description of what it may have been other than this was a place that had extended lightning uh, and, and thunder and damage and un- unbelievable things that if you want more information on that book, I'd be happy to get it for you afterwards. But after crossing the Red Sea, the Jewish people saw God provide for them in the most unique of ways. God fed them. I mean, think of the logistical nightmare that it would have been to take two million people without a whole lot of food to the desert. And and God feeds them. Day and night, the people receive a meal called manna. Their breakfast and their dinner appear each day prepared in the kitchen of heaven for them. And in the small group that Cindy and I are part of, Brandon Lurch earlier this week was talking about last week's sermon and just the, the logistical challenges of two million people being fed and being taken care of and being in the wilderness for that long. He said to our group, you realize that we're ending our desert operations that we've been a part of since 9-11. And 1.3 million Americans have been part of that. And think about the logistical challenges of taking care of the 1.3 million Americans. Now I add 700,000 more people. Let's say there's no real infrastructure for housing, that kind of thing. You're stuck in the desert for not uh, 11 or 12 years, but for 40 years is what it will eventually become. There will be a generation that's born to this 2 million. This 2 million will all die. There will be a wilderness. Unbelievable logistical challenges. And, uh, And God did it. It's amazing. God had done so much for these people. Deliverance from oppressors, 10 plagues with the Jewish people spared from the judgment that the Egyptian people received. Crossing the Red Sea on dry land, manna from heaven, even a pillar of cloud and fire to lead them on their journey. God had taken care of his people. How could any of them doubt his existence? How could any one of these people doubt that the hand of God had worked on their behalf? How could any one of them doubt that God had a special place for them? And now they come to Mount Sinai. And in Exodus 20, Moses receives the Ten Commandments. And in the chapters that follow, additional instruction about the law. He was speaking with God and God was giving Moses the instructions for the children of Israel to live as a covenantal people unto God, a people who'd been set apart, a special people. And it should have seemed to the people of God God, that he was finally answering their prayers. They should have felt so close to God in that moment. I wonder if you can remember some times in your life where you have felt incredibly close to God. For teenagers, in a couple weeks, many of our our students are going to be going to Camp Forest Springs. And what they experience on that retreat year in and year out is this mountaintop experience with God where God moves in their life and they'll come back and their parents will go, who, who are these kids? You know, well, this, is, this is my child for about 10 minutes and then they get tired and you know, those kind of things and sometimes fight and argue and those things and go back to normal. But we had these experiences in our life where we had these mountaintop experiences with God. Some of you have been a mission, on a mission trip. Some of you can remember that first mission trip you went on and you saw God move in such incredible ways in that trip and, and you experienced his presence in unique ways and you said, I'm never going to be the same. We love when we see God's hand at work. We love when we feel his presence in ways that are sometimes difficult to feel in our day-to-day life. That's why spiritual retreats are important. That's why it's important even for us to have silent retreats every once in a while, where we just go on our own away for a 24-hour period or a 48-hour period and, uh, and spend some time with God. Sometimes that's a great gift that you can give to your spouse. It's a great gift that you can say, you know what, I'm going to take care of the kids. I'm going to take care of the family. I want you to go and you spend some time with God. But then then something happened to the children of Israel. This mountaintop experience was incredible. But their leader, Moses, had been gone longer than they expected. 
Forty days Moses had been talking with God, and the people hadn't seen him. They saw the cloud, they saw the pillar, they saw the proof that God was still there, but they wondered if maybe he had died. He was gone uh, much longer than they expected. You know, not every one of the two million people who left Egypt probably was at the same place spiritually. Like any group of people, there were those who were spiritually mature and there were those who weren't. And there was a group of those who weren't that uh, were outspoken. They doubted God's power. And some of them were glad just to be out of Egypt, but not really thrilled about being in the desert. And I imagine some were just plain bored. And we see idolatry's slippery slope begin to show its ugly face in Exodus 32, 1 through 6. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in the ears, their ears, and brought them to Aaron. And he received their gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. I mean, how ridiculous, how utterly foolish at this point. These are your gods who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And by the way, the Hebrew and rose up to play is really the idea of sexual immorality. And so they're they're engaging in sexual immorality. They're eating, they're drinking, they're carousing, and they're worshiping some idol that they are now attributing to being the power in their life that took them out of Egypt. And notice that it's Aaron, whom God has appointed as the high priest of the people, the spiritual leader of the nation, that led this idolatrous rebellion. Once the people came to him with the idea, Aaron then gives them instructions. He goes right along with it. In fact, he tells them how they're going to do it. Bring me the gold. He creates an idol with gold. He encourages the people to worship it and then proclaims a feast to the idol and presides over the worship of this thing, this this golden calf made from earrings. And in our 21st century sophistication, we wonder why. Why would anybody want to bow down and worship at an inanimate object that was created by somebody's hands with their jewelry? Why would anybody who'd experienced the blessings of God in their life, who had seen the miracles, who had seen a Red Sea part, who had seen the, the hand of God in such incredible ways, so quickly descend into idolatry until we realize that we're guilty of the same thing? There's not one of us here who has not been guilty of breaking God's first commandment. And many of us who have been guilty of breaking his second commandment. I find it ironic that while God was giving Moses the law, the children of Israel were busy breaking both the first and the second commandments and several of them that followed. Look at Exodus 20, 1 through 6. And keep in mind that in Exodus 20, when God is speaking to Moses and giving him the Ten Commandments, if you read a little bit later in Exodus 20, you're going to see that the children of Israel heard these words and then Moses left and departed and God gave them the rest of the law. So they knew the Ten Commandments at this time. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth below or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. And believe me, the children of Israel learned that lesson from God. But showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love and keep my commandments. Do you think that God is passionate about us not having any other gods before him? It is both the first commandment and the second commandment directly relates to it. Tim Keller is one of my favorite pastors, one of my favorite authors. We have several of his books in our library. 
And when I, he, he, he writes this. He says, when I first began reading through the Bible, I looked for some unifying themes. I concluded that there are many, and that if we make just one theme, such as covenant or kingdom, the theme, then we run in danger of reductionism. However, one of the main ways to read the Bible is the ages-long struggle between true faith and idolatry. In the beginning, human beings were made to worship and serve God and to rule over all created things in God's name, Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Paul understands humanity's original sin as an act of idolatry. In Romans 1, 21 through 25, he uses some of these words. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. Instead of living for God, we begin to live for ourselves or our work or for material goods. We reverse the original intended order. And then we began to worship and serve created things. Paradoxically, the created things came to rule over us. Instead of being God's vice regents ruling over creation, now creation masters us. We are now subject to decay and disease and disaster. The final proof of this is death itself. We live for our own glory by toiling in the dust, but eventually we will return to dust. And the dust wins, Genesis 3, 17 through 19. We live to make a name for ourselves, but our names are forgotten. Here in the beginning of the Bible, we learn that idolatry means slavery and death. Get that? Slavery. The children of Israel have just been released from slavery, and idolatry brings them right back into it. He continues, the Ten Commandments' first two and most basic laws, one-fifth of all God's law to humankind, are against idolatry. Exodus does not envision any third option between true faith and idolatry. We will either worship the uncreated God, or we will worship some created thing, an idol. There is no possibility of worshiping nothing. Did you catch that? There is no possibility of worshiping nothing. The classic New Testament text on this is Romans 1, 18 through 25. This extensive passage in idolatry is often seen as only referring to pagan Gentiles, but instead we should recognize it as an analysis of what sin is and how it works. Verse 21 tells us that the reason we turn to idols is because we want to control our lives, though we know that we owe God everything. Though they knew God, they neither glorified God nor gave thanks to him. Verse 25 tells us the strategy for control, taking created things and setting our hearts on them and building our lives around them. Since we need to worship something because of how we are created, we cannot eliminate God without creating God's substitutes. We cannot eliminate God without creating God's substitutes. Look at the... Uh, screen here verses 21 and 25 he says tells us the two results of idolatry number one is deception their thinking became futile and their hearts were darkened and number two is slavery they worshiped and served created things he concludes whatever we worship we serve for worship and service are always inextricably bound together we are covenantal beings we enter into covenant service with whatever most captures our imagination and heart it ensnares us so every human personality community thought form and culture will be based on some ultimate concern or ultimate allegiance either to god or to some god substitute individually we will ultimately look either to god or we'll look to success romance family status popularity beauty or something else that makes us feel personally significant and secure to guide our choices culturally we will either ultimately look to god or to the free market the state the elites the will of the people science technology military might human reason racial pride or something else to make us corporately significant and secure and to guide our choices do you see how easy it is to slip into idolatry without even realizing that we're doing it. It's incredible insight into some of our American idols. Last night I took some time to just write down some of the things that have been idols in my life over the 42 years that I've lived. And it was a sobering and a hard thing. So I took a paper and I began to write down, okay, Schulenberg, what have been your idols in your life at one point or another? I found that entertainment has been it wanting to feed, you know, my desires and and, and my time. Sports at one time or another have fallen into that. Food certainly has fallen into that on too many occasions. 
girls as I was younger, and, and that was my consuming passion for a number of years. Family, um, allowing my family to be placed ahead of God, my comfort, money, video games, and the time that can be wasted on things like that. Fun, fishing, friends, popularity, routine, politics, myself. And I probably could have gone on and on about things that I have allowed to be an idol in my life at one time or another. And I don't like this list. I don't like that there's so many things that I've allowed to have a higher precedence than God in my life. I'd like you to take a moment this morning, if you will, to write down what some of those idols have been in your life. Have there been some things in your life that you've allowed to creep in and take precedence over God? Take just a couple minutes, if you would, and write down that list. I don't know about you, but that's not my favorite homework assignment. I don't like seeing those things on paper. Some of you are going to continue writing, and that's fine. You continue to do that as God reveals things to you. When we allow ourselves to have idols, we're breaking the first commandment. We break the very heart of God. It's when we begin to act as somebody who is an unbeliever. It's what the children of Israel did, as those who should have believed more than anybody to not only act as unbelievers, but to fashion something with their hands and worship it. John MacArthur has written the following. Part of the unbeliever's bondage is to the worship of false gods, which even the atheistic and agnostic have. They can no more keep from worshiping their sophisticated idols of various sorts than a primitive tribesman can keep from worshiping his carved fetish. Each is a slave to sin, led astray by the dumb idols, however he is led. No idol can respond to man's needs, By definition, an idol is man-made and impersonal. No idol, primitive or sophisticated, can answer a person's questions, give him revelation, assure him of truth, forgive him of sin, or endow him with dignity, meaning, and peace. Just as no unregenerate person can help being led into some form of idolatry, no idol can help being dumb. Whether or not a person or a demon is behind it, an idol is totally helpless to benefit the one who worships it. So why are we so susceptible to love and to trust in things more than God? Keller writes, sin isn't only doing bad things, it is fundamentally making good things into ultimate things. Sin is building your life and meaning on anything, even a very good thing, more than on God. Whatever we build our life on will drive us and enslave us. Sin is primarily idolatry. None of those things that I mentioned in my list of idols in and of themselves are bad. But they're bad when we take them 
out of control and we place them at a place that is higher than God. We're susceptible of idolatry because we're susceptible to sin. Paul writes that prior to our relationship with Christ, we're slaves to sin. It was St. Augustine who wrote, idolatry is worshiping anything that ought to be used or using anything that ought to be worshiped. How many times do we use God? How many times do we see him as a thing that we have to go to and ask for and beseech for for our problems? Listen, God's response to idolatry is shown in Exodus 32, 7 through 20. And the Lord said to Moses, go down for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I have commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed to it and have said, these are your gods, O Israel, whom you brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and that I may consume them, in order that I may make a great nation of you. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your, by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven. And all this land that I have promised you, I will give your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of by bringing, of bringing on his people. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of testimony in his hand, tablets that were written on, on both sides, on the front and on the back they were written. The tablets were the work of God. And the writing was the writing of God engraved in the tablets. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a noise, a war in the camp. But he said, it is not the song, sound of shouting for victory or the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing I hear. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot, and he threw the tablets out of his hands, and he broke them on the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf that they had made, and he burned it with fire, and he ground it to powder, and he scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. God was furious. Moses was furious. Joshua, who was with Moses on that mountain, his generals, like, what are the people going to war for without me? And then he realizes what's going on. He's furious and confused. So furious was God that he almost wiped the entire line out and said, we'll just start a new nation with you, Moses. And Moses pleads with God. God relents. But God shows that he's a jealous God. He wants nothing or no one to be worshipped ahead of him. And God's jealousy is a good thing. He's the lover of our souls, and we should expect no less. He loves us more than anyone here on earth could ever love us. And those of us who have been in love, if we feel betrayed by the one that loved us, we're jealous. We hurt. Our hearts break. We're created in the image of God. God is the same way. In 1989, today in the Word, a Christian periodical published the following words. Though we do not face a pantheon of false gods like the Israelites did, we face the pressures from a pantheon of false values. Materialism, love of leisure, sensuality, worship of self, security, and many others. The second commandment deals with idols. This may be something that most of us can't relate to unless we include life goals that revolve around something other than God himself. What is the object of our affections, our efforts, our attention? Where does the majority of our time go to? On what do we spend the greatest amount of our resources? God has, for so many of us in our lives, been an add-on. We love God, we go to church, we go to work, we've got our family, we've got hobbies, we've got friends, and we've got God. I've shared John Piper's quote oftentimes with you, that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Are you satisfied in him today? Is he your consuming passion? The children of Israel were quick to depart from the law of God. When they became tired of waiting and uncertain of God's plan, they replaced God with a golden calf. Again, sometimes we're guilty of the same thing without recognizing it. 
Years ago, Henry Nouwen wrote a book entitled The Wounded Healer. And in the book, he retells a tale from ancient India. He says four royal brothers decided that they would each master a special ability. Time went by and the brothers met to reveal what they had learned. I've mastered a science, said the first, by which I can take but a bone of some creature and create the flesh that goes around that bone. I, the second brother said, know how to take that creature's skin and hair if there is flesh on it and and, and give it hair if there's flesh on its bones. The third said, I'm able to create the limbs and if I have the flesh and the skin and the hair. And I, concluded the fourth, know how to give life to a creature if its form is complete. Thereupon the brothers went into the jungle to find a bone so they could demonstrate their specialties. As fate would have it, the bone they found was a lion's. One added flesh to the bone. The second grew hair and hide. The third completed it with matching limbs and the fourth gave life to the lion. And shaking its mane, the ferocious beast arose and jumped on its creators. And he killed them and all vanished quickly into the, and and he vanished contently into the jungle. We too have a capacity to create that which can devour us. Goals and dreams can consume us. Possessions and property can turn and destroy us unless we first seek God's kingdom and righteousness and allow him to breathe into us what makes uh, life. May you, like Moses, smash the idols that have been created in your life, clinging first to Jesus, his kingdom, and his righteousness. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the story of the children of Israel and their failure that you've included in Scripture. Again, you continually show people at their best and at their worst, and this was certainly amongst the worst. And God, while they were primitive and the gods that they worshipped were idols created with jewelry, we are so guilty of the same thing. We're guilty of creating things in our life or taking things that you've created that are good and perverting it by putting it ahead of you. God, help us not to be a people that are ever content to place an idol in front of the one who was never created, to allow the creation to become more important than the creator. Lord, thanks that you relented. Thank you that in your anger that was burning against the children of Israel, you showed compassion as well. And thank you that you have done that for us. And thank you that you offer us compassion through your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, so that we might experience redemption, forgiveness, a life that is whole and complete. Help us, Lord, to, to not allow anything in this world to get in the place of Jesus. In your precious name we pray. Amen. We're going to take communion now. And again, it's the time to remember what Jesus has done for us. Most of you are people who've been at Woodbury Community Church for a while, but if you haven't, we want you to know that communion is something that's open to anyone who's a follower of Jesus Christ. If you've trusted him as your Lord and Savior, this is a time for the children of God to remember what Jesus did for us. God knew that uh, we wouldn't just be guilty of breaking the first commandment and the second. Most of us would break multiple commandments. Most of us uh, throughout our lives would be guilty of not loving God like we should, not loving others like he's called us to do, not being part of his process of making disciples, and you can continue to name that. Communion is a time for us to say, Lord, examine my life. The psalmist said, search me, O God, and know my heart, and test me and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We need God's touch in our lives. We need his forgiveness. It's not a A one-time thing. Salvation is a one-time thing. But when sin gets in the way of God and we wonder, God, where are you? Why aren't you answering those prayers? Well, if we've got sin in our life, it's blocking that relationship with God and we need to take care of it. That's why in the New Testament, Jesus said, if you're making a gift at the altar and there you remember your brother or sister has something against you, go and make it right with them. Because when you approach a holy God, we need to have things right in our life. And we're approaching God as we take communion. We're saying, Jesus, we remember. Saying, Jesus, we're grateful. 
saying, Jesus, thank you for what you did for us. Thank you that you even loved idolatrous people so much that you gave your life. I ask our ushers to come forward. And listen, if you don't have a relationship with Christ, if you've never accepted his forgiveness, if he can forgive an idolatrous nation, he can forgive you. There's nothing you've done that is so far that God, God won't forgive. And salvation is not something that you do. It's something God does. Salvation isn't something you've earned. It's something that Jesus earned for you on the cross. It's a gift that he offers. And like every gift, we're unworthy of it. None of us deserve the gifts we get. We need to accept the gift that Jesus has offered to us. And so if today you're ready to say, Jesus, I I haven't been your child, but I want to be. I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer as our elders come forward. And then we're going to invite you to celebrate your new life in Christ um, by taking communion and remembering his sacrifice for you. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. Again, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you that you are a God who is greater than any God that we can create in our own lives or that this society has created or um, anything else. Lord, we we tell you that, uh, I tell you today, God, that I need you. Jesus, today I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I believe that you are who you said that you were. I believe that when you died on that cross, you died for me and everyone who's ever trusted you as Lord and Savior. And Jesus, you died for this world. And and Jesus, that's me. So today I thank you. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins. I give my life to you. Jesus, I declare that you are my God. You are my Lord. Today I invite you to take control of my life. In Jesus' name.